let's face it, feeling overwhelmed during some part of your wedding planning journey is inevitable. Not to worry, because today we're going to review three of my favorite easy ways to keep calm, cool, and collected while planning your wedding. I also have three of your amazing questions to share on affordable DIY favor ideas, place card etiquette, and wedding planning when you're on a tight time frame. All that and more is coming up next on the Wedding Planning Podcast. Hey there, it's Kara, and I'm here to help you streamline and simplify your wedding plans with straightforward, down-to-earth advice on planning the wedding of your dreams. Let's be real. There are some really juicy secrets that the wedding industry does not want you to know, and a little bit of insider knowledge could save you thousands of dollars. Come behind the scenes with me to unveil three wedding industry secrets by visiting weddingplanningpodcast.co slash secret. Enjoy the show. Today, I wanted to have a quick talk about some of my favorite ways to stay calm, cool, and collected as you are planning your wedding. Because let's get real overwhelm exists. And it is really easy to go from feeling like you've got everything totally under control to feeling like you are completely spiraling and you've got nothing getting done and things are just really overwhelming you. So today I want to talk about some of my favorite tools and ways to kind of keep yourself organized and avoid feeling like that. I feel excited, stressed out, overwhelmed and overwhelmed. I'm having fun. It's a little overwhelmed at the beginning. Nerve-wracking at the same time. It is my number one goal of my wedding planning podcast life to keep you feeling calm, cool, and collected. And now into the good stuff of today's episode. I want to share my three favorite ways to keep yourself feeling organized and on top of things as you're planning. When I hear from you guys in emails, a very common thread is that you're feeling overwhelmed. And that's not to say that I don't receive emails that simply say, hey, Cara, thank you so much for the podcast. I'm loving planning my wedding. Your advice is great. Thank you so much. Just wanted to say thanks. I get a lot of those too. But a lot of emails I receive, the common thread is just this feeling of being utterly overwhelmed by some aspect of your wedding planning. So of course, the details are all different, but the theme is very similar. My first piece of advice, if you find yourself feeling totally underwater and just completely wanting to throw your hands up in the air and take a break from planning, that's okay. That's fine. I want to advise you to simply take a step back and take a deep breath and just put the issue that you're having into very crystal clear perspective. This is some tough love and I don't mean this to hurt anyone's feelings. Part of why I'm here is to kind of give you the other side of the story, which is I've been married for seven, almost seven years now. So the tough love is that your wedding day might not wind up to be the most important day of your entire life. I know that right now in the midst of planning it, it is a humongous deal. It is an extremely special day. And for a while, it is the most important day of your life. But then you might have a baby or a -a once-in-a-lifetime career move or a travel opportunity. And there are a million amazing things that the universe has in store for you and also for your fiance. So please don't get too wrapped up in thinking that if every tiny thing about your wedding day isn't exactly perfect, that the world is going to stop spinning. It's not. The sun is going to rise the next day and whatever it is that you get stuck on and whatever it is that pushes you over the edge and just has you again feeling that that totally helpless feeling of being completely overwhelmed. All I'm saying is don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Okay? 
So this tip is very simple. Taking a deep breath, a deep cleansing, reflective breath is actually a bonus way to beat the overwhelm. I have three more for you. So let's dive into three other very concrete tools that you can rely on to keep your organization and your sanity intact. The first tool that I rave and talk about all the time is Pinterest. Pinterest is organization for those of you who are creative people, who are visual people, you're probably really enjoying planning your wedding. You have big visions. Pinterest is simply the best tool that I can find, in my opinion, where you can visually keep everything, all of your visions, all of your ideas on the same platform and be able to visually share those ideas with others who are close to you. So of course, Pinterest is a public platform, much like Facebook. Um, well, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the nuances and the differences and the similarities. But of course, when you post something on Pinterest, it's visible to everyone out there on Pinterest. But when you create boards and choose to share them with, say, your bridesmaids, your maid of honor, your mother, your fiance, you can send people very, very, very specific things that you want them to look at as well and maybe give their input in on or collaborate on. So Pinterest is very good, again, for keeping all of those big ideas, those creative, visual big inspirational ideas organized. I love Pinterest. I will always encourage you guys to use Pinterest. I'll put a link to all of my wedding Pinterest boards in today's show notes, and I'll also include a link in a recap email so that we can connect there. The next tool that I love for staying organized is called Asana, A-S-A-N-A. And this is more of an organizational tool for those of us who are very detail oriented, very list driven. So analytical details, it's very streamlined. So what Asana does is it allows you to create a detailed project list and you create teams of people to share those project lists with. So much like Pinterest, you're creating a project and then you are sharing it with, for example, your wedding party or your mom and your sister or your fiance and his mom or whoever you may choose. You create the teams and you share it however you see appropriate. So for example, you need to finalize your wedding photographer. At first glance, this seems pretty straightforward, but what about all the little things that go into selecting your photographer? It's not as simple as just sitting down and taking five minutes to select a photographer. Lots of you know this because you're probably in the thick of it. Uh, that's what Asana is for. So the big project is titled choose a wedding photographer. And then what you're going to do is you're going to list all the steps you need to take to get that completed. So for example, these might be do an internet search for local photographers, ask friends online for referrals, narrow your search results and make a phone call to the top five of them. Schedule in-person meetings to meet in person, review portfolio, make sure your relationship is good and you are compatible. And finally, schedule an engagement shoot. You would make your list in Asana and then you could send some of these tasks over to your fiance to complete. So for example, I'm personally not really a huge fan of starting from scratch with just a Google search. I find that a little bit overwhelming. So you could ask your fiance to do maybe the first three things I mentioned, which is run a quick Google search, ask your friends for some referrals, and narrow it down to five. And then you could take it from there. You could pick up the phone, call the top five. You could schedule the meetings. You could schedule the engagement shoot. So see how you can break up these big projects, these bigger size tasks into these small little manageable pieces and delegate. It is so helpful. 
And for someone listening with a project management background or someone who's very, very, very organized, this is second nature. But for those of us who are less organized, breaking a task into those small parts and then again, being able to tackle the small pieces one by one is a huge lifesaver. So again, this tool is called Asana, A-S-A-N-A dot com, and it's totally free to use. And a quick word on Pinterest and Asana, they both work really well together too. So it's not just using one or the other. The example project might be choosing your wedding theme and colors. And so with Pinterest, you can visually go out and collect all of the inspiration And then with Asana, you could keep a list of the tasks that are associated with that bigger project so that you can send them off to people and ask people to go in and complete certain very specific things. This way you don't have five people all just working like willy-nilly on one thing. You can actually specifically ask certain people to do certain things and it keeps everyone on a little bit tighter of a leash and just keeps things more organized. Okay, and the final tool, and I'm going to warn you, I'm a little bit biased, but the final tool that I am going to recommend that all of you use is to sign up to receive podcast emails from me. I send them out weekly. They are totally free. And I send them in conjunction with each new episode that is published of the podcast. This is an amazing way, and again, totally biased source here, (laughs) this is an amazing way for those of you who want kind of a wedding planning mentor who can give you some trusted advice, who can give you some trusted tools. My goal in, again, I said this at the beginning of the show, but my goal in wedding planning podcast life is to minimize your feeling overwhelmed. And if you're listening to the podcast while you're out on a run or you're chopping meat for dinner or you're driving to work, I realize that you don't always have a pen in your hand to jot things down like notes or follow up ideas, a website address, etc. I know you. I can see you. You're on the treadmill at the gym and you're thinking to yourself, Oh yeah, asana.com. That sounds really, really good. I'm totally going to check that out. And then two hours later, you get home and you're like, wait a minute, what was that website you talked about? And you totally mean to go back and look it up, but you never do. And then it's lost and there you go. There you have it. That's why you need to sign up for recap emails from me. I will send you a direct link to all those things we talk about so that you never ever have to forget to look it up again. For wedding planning podcast emails, you can head to our website, weddingplanningpodcast.co. I'll be right back with your questions answered after a quick word from today's show sponsor. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at The Big Fake Wedding. The Big Fake Wedding is the ultimate wedding experience. Appearing in 30 cities across the country, you can be a guest at a perfectly planned fake wedding. You'll see wedding vendors in action, meet them in person, and experience all the fun of being a guest at an unforgettable wedding. Of course, planning your wedding is important, but our friends at The Big Fake Wedding also believe in planning your marriage. This event is meant to be an emotional reminder of that, all while you get to enjoy drinks, food, and dancing. We absolutely love our local vendors and truly believe in helping to grow their passion and business. So you'll get to experience the best of the best with a very small and intimate vendor team. Gone are the days of humongous impersonal traditional expos and bridal shows. You're looking for an unforgettable, fun experience. And the Big Fake Wedding provides just that, all while taking the stress out of planning your special day. And not to mention all the great wedding swag and exclusive discounts that you'll enjoy. 
There are still 23 big fake weddings left in 2019, and they're taking place everywhere across the country from Charleston, Detroit, Los Angeles, to Birmingham, Nashville, San Francisco, and so many more great cities. Grab your tickets while they last by visiting thebigfakewedding.com. And don't forget to use the promo code WEDDING and you'll get $10 off your ticket. That website again is www.thebigfakewedding.com and you'll save $10 with promo code WEDDING. I'll put a link to that website in today's show notes as well. Back to the show. Okay, welcome back, and I love this part. I'm going to share three listener questions and answers that came in from Instagram. If you would like to follow along and get in on future Q&As on the weekly shows, follow Wedding Planning Podcast, that's all one word, on Instagram. I drop a ton of really fun polls, ask you yes or no questions, take votes, and of course, I collect your questions so that we can talk about them on the weekly episodes. So first question for this week comes from Lexi, and she's wondering about tips for planning a wedding when your fiance is in the military, doing training, and deployments are coming up, so they need to plan quick. What are some tips for planning a wedding when you don't have a ton of time? Thank you so much for your question, Lexi, and I have three quick tips for you. The first one is to keep it simple. And I love this piece of wedding advice for anybody, regardless of whether you have just a few months to plan or if you have a couple of years to plan, I am always a fan of keeping it as simple as possible. This is going to dramatically cut down on the number of decisions you need to make, and it's going to make your life a lot easier. So if you're faced with one option that looks really complicated and one option that's all laid out for you, Take the easy route and keep it simple. My second tip for you, Lexi, is to stay really organized. And this question fits in perfectly with today's show. And the three resources at the beginning are all going to be perfect for you to keep right on top of things and keep yourself really organized. Those, again, were Pinterest, the website Asana, And then, of course, subscribing to Wedding Planning Podcast emails where I will send you a recap of everything we talk about here so that you have it in a nice, written, organized format. And then my final tip for you if you're planning a wedding with not a ton of time is to really lean on your network of friends and family for help. They love you, they are there for you, and I'm sure that they would all love to offer their expertise, their time, and their skills to help you pull off the most special wedding you could ever imagine. So ask them for referrals for wedding vendors who they have used or who they may know of. Maybe they have friends and family in the wedding industry who they can send you to to get taken care of. Ask them for help with various research, any tasks that you need taken care of. Be a delegator and lean on your loved ones and really rely on them to help you. Again, I know they'll be happy to do it. And this is really going to give you a lot of room in terms of the things that you can accomplish in a tight amount of time. I hope those three tips are helpful to you, Lexi, and thank you again. Our next question is from Cassie, and she wonders when writing out place cards, is one name per card or should we do one couple per card? So place cards are the thing that are going to guide your guests to their seats at the reception, and they are also oftentimes used for your caterer to indicate a meal choice. So if you're having two or three different options of what food a guest can eat, oftentimes you'll put like a little color-coded sticker or something on that card that lets the wait staff know who's eating what. So now that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about, whether you put one name per card or one couple per card is going to be totally up to your personal preference. So for example, if my husband, John, and I are going to a wedding, would we each have our own card with Cara's name and one with John's name? Or would we have one card with John and Cara both on it together? 
If you are hosting a really big wedding and you have 150 guests, 200 guests, 200 plus guests, if we're dealing with a lot of people, it might be beneficial for you to group couples together on the same card. Now, of course, not everybody is going to come to the wedding as a part of a couple. So you may have single cards where just a single name goes on. That's totally fine. But generally speaking, if you can group couples on one card together, it's going to mean almost 50% fewer cards that you need to buy. If you're doing professional calligraphy, that's also an added expense. So that can cut down on that. And it's going to also take up a lot less space on a place card table. So if you can imagine a place card table that has 250 place cards displayed on it, that is a ton of names and it's going to take your guests a lot of time to go through and find their cards. So in a big wedding scenario, it may be beneficial to go ahead and put couples together on the same card. Now, <laughs> deep breath, because there are also a few benefits to using just one name per card. And those are if you... So let me say if you're working with a smaller size wedding, 100 people or less, one name per card is going to be a lot more manageable. One name per card also will let your guests put their individual cards on their individual seats or their individual place setting so that I can take my card, Cara, and put my name on my seat and my husband, John, can take his card and put his name on his seat. So there's no confusion about who is actually sitting where. One name per card also can be more personal um, if you look at it, you know, that way. I don't think that's a huge push to do one way or the other. I think the fact that you're making place cards for your guests to begin with is very thoughtful. Um, but one name per card, you know, some people could see that as being a more personal touch than two names together on the same card. Probably my biggest, now that I've talked about this for a little bit longer than I anticipated I would. But probably my biggest benefit that I see to doing one name per card is going to be back to the meal selection thing that I touched on a minute ago. So if your catering staff is going to require you to indicate a guest's meal selection on their place card, then you will need to do one name per card unless you can talk with them through a solution you know some other way of indicating that so do be sure if there's any doubt in your mind check in with your caterer or your event coordinator at the venue and just ask them what the deal is going to be for indicating guests who have different meal choices that might answer the question for you Cassie I hope that was helpful and if anybody out there has any other suggestions or stories or tips of their own to share, then please chime in. And our last question for today comes from Lauren. And Lauren wonders if we have some cheap and easy do-it-yourself wedding favor ideas. Thank you, Lauren. I love wedding favors. And if you're thinking of having them at your wedding, then doing those yourself is a really, really cost-effective way of getting that item taken care of. Much like anything having to do with your wedding, you can spend very little on favors or you can spend a lot of money on favors. The range of options is humongous. And side note before I dive in, I will say here too, if you want to do away with the guest favors altogether, then that is a great option as well. I didn't have favors at my wedding. I talked about that a few weeks back. If you want to skip it, then please, you certainly have my blessing to do so. Two of my very favorite and very affordable wedding favor ideas are, number one, if you go back through your podcast feed back to October of 2018, you'll see an episode titled DIY Cake Pops. 
And that show is a detailed shopping trip, ingredient list, and a how-to on how to make these really, really cute and really affordable cake pops all yourself at home. It's a really fun project. It takes a little bit of time, but it is not difficult and it's super affordable. So if you're into doing a project and you have some friends or family members who would be up for helping you, I think that's a great way to get everyone together and spend the evening doing that in the days leading up to the wedding. They keep really well too. So honestly, you could probably get away with doing this in the week or two leading up to the wedding. So go check out that episode. You'll find it back in October of 2018 if you just scroll back through the available episodes on whatever podcast player you're listening to this episode on. And the same idea, the same, it's basically dipping cake pops or Oreo cookie pops in melted chocolate, you can use that same exact method for dipping long pretzel sticks or something that's really easy too. They're actually a little more durable and that might be even easier. So you can make variations on that recipe and that process. And then one more favor idea that I really love is to go ahead and make a dessert bar with all of your favorite treats and sweets and candies, and then supply your guests with some really cute boxes or really cute little favor bags. You can find these at your local craft store in the cake baking aisle, or if there's like a cookie decorating section, look in there. They're not expensive. You can buy candy in bulk for really reasonable And I love this because it serves as not only a tasty treat for your guests to take home and enjoy, but it also serves as the guest favor, this little baggie of candy that they're taking home. You can certainly have fun little labels printed, a thank you label or something along those lines. Search the internet for favor tags or wedding thank you tags. These can be downloaded and made really, really easily. And last but not least, I have tons of visual examples of wedding favors that are super easy to do on your own. I have those all stockpiled over on Pinterest and you can look up the link to that board. I'll leave it in today's show notes and I'll also send that link along in this week's email recap. Thank you again so much to everybody who submitted questions. I always try to get back to every one of you with at least a quick reply. Thank you, thank you, thank you to get in on future Q&As. Visit us on Instagram, Wedding Planning Podcast, all one word, and I can't wait to connect. Thanks again for being here today, and we'll chat again soon. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. For any notes and links mentioned in today's episode, be sure to take a look at the show notes when you have a hands-free moment. And don't forget about that fun bonus I mentioned at the beginning of today's show. To learn three juicy secrets that the wedding industry does not want you to know about, visit weddingplanningpodcast.co slash secret. Together, we'll unveil three wedding myths that can potentially save you thousands of dollars. To sign up today, that website again is weddingplanningpodcast.co slash secret. Cheers until next time.